Thank you, Aditya, and uh, a very good evening to everybody. Uh, as Aditya did mention that we are talking about a fund, which is our IFL Phoenix portfolio. But before getting into the fund's contours and what the fund is all about, let's talk about uh, the basic principle of uh, wealth management. And, you know, very nicely being um, stated by Sir Warren Buffet when he has said that uh, the very first principle of being in a wealth business is ensure that your clients do not lose money. And the second principle that he has been very advocating about had been that, you know, never ever miss following the first principle. So basically, let's start something around that part only. I'm sure as we look into the markets of today, one thing is, uh, is pretty much concerning, which is where are we? Uh, is it adequately priced? Is the, are the markets expensive? Are the markets cheap? And I'm sure this is one question which is bothering irrespective what segment do you belong to if you're an advisor or a client or even a manager. Uh, I think it's bothering everybody. So what we tried doing it, we just tried to put some rational and some uh, you know, uh, dots around it. And uh, what we have done instead of price to earning and uh, other others contours that the market do look at, we are talking about a price to book, which is basically talking about what kind of price are you ready to put looking at the intrinsic values of the companies. And if you go back and look at last 20, 22 odd years, what we have seen is that uh, at an average, at an average, the price to book is close to 3.1. This slide is a little dated one. Uh, as we talked today with the recent rally, which has happened, the, the price to book has now gone to 3.3, slightly more than the what an average has been. But let's build on this case of price to book and let's uh, draw a uh, one standard deviation negative and a one standard deviation positive and looks at how do we build the range. So assuming one standard deviation negative comes to 2.4, one positive goes to 3.8. So basically this becomes the range for the markets to behave in last 22 odd years. But interestingly, if you would have seen, there are seven occasions where the markets have fallen meaningful. Now, what do we mean by meaningful? We basically are talking about markets fall in excess of 30% if we look at from the highs. And there were seven instances in the history and the recent one was in 2020 alone. I'm talking about a pandemic time when market actually come to one minor standard deviation. But interestingly, what market does is it doesn't spend long time over there. So the moment it is one minus, which is a less than two kind of a price to book, it doesn't spend more than 5% of a time. But anybody or any, anyone who is able to capitalize at that point of time on the market is going to see around 40 odd percent kind of a compounded annual over next five years. So this is the beauty of one minor standard deviation that A, it, the market doesn't spend enough time, but the rewards are phenomenal. And if you go just the opposite to that, and we see someone who is entering into the market at the highest possible level, which again was a very recent one in 2021, when the market actually touched around 3.7, 3.8 on a standard deviation, which is on a price to book. Uh, again, market just like less than two, doesn't spend enough time, but the returns also are pretty muted. So one thesis which comes out very clearly from these two data point, that if you take a five-year view on a market, even if you are entering at a highest possible level, your probability to lose money becomes zero and you still end up making say four to five odd percent kind of a money or a compounded over five years. Yes, it may not be the real growth of the money, but yes, the money still had grown. Now, if I take away those 16%, which is a five on a, on a lower side, 11 on a higher side, and we are at an 84%, that's where the market spends most of its time, which is a price to a book between two and, and a four. And if you see the median return, for these times is anything between 11 and 12 percent. Now, as I understand from Aditya, we have all possible audience uh, uh, of every category, which is we have the HNIs, we have the distributors, advisors. Now, if you remember, any one of you who approaches a client and says to him, them that, look, equity as an asset class, A is a long-term asset class, and a B, if you are investing in that asset class, you should have an expectation anything between 12 to 13 percent compounded. Now that word of 12 to 13% compounded wasn't coming on its own. 
there was a reflection of a science for that and the science is this only which is 84% of time market actually spends between 10 and 13 and around median being 11 to 12% that's the return expectation that actually we build when we all and every time when we approach a client and 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 that's that's what an equity uh, you know asset class is all about so today's time, if you look at, at a 3.3, we are neither expensive nor a cheap market. And hence, it's become very, very critical as an advisor when we are approaching to the client to offer him something where we see that the downside risks are limited. Uh, and, and, and that's where the fund, which is a Phoenix fund, is coming into uh, you know, effect. Now, what if I look at Phoenix, what it talks about, it basically talks about identifying the turnaround stories. Now, during the pandemic times, and I'm pretty sure many of us have witnessed that, that the great companies weren't able to, you know, give the kind, you know, were not able to uh, give, generate the kind of top line that they were generating in the past because of the reasons beyond their control, which ha and that has resulted into a contraction in the profitability, further resulting into ROEs and the company's prices started declining. So. So these are the classic cases, but were there anything wrong with those companies? Answer was not. It was basically the situation which created, which got created because of which, you know, the performances started showing a muted note. Now it could be, so these kind of stories can be of any reasons, you know, can be because of any reason. It could be capital allocation was suboptimal, uh, promoters weren't ready to, uh, you know, infuse capital. There could be some regulatory changes which could result, some behavioral ones, maybe economic, weak economic activity, as I was mentioning during the pandemic. So these are the factors which could result into a company getting into the bucket of turnaround. And these are the companies which had an established track record and now have a potential to again show us sharp uh, you know, growth once the fundamental starts improving as we go further. And that's exactly what I meant that turnaround is all about short-term business disruptions for the reasons beyond your control. But as we go ahead, we start noticing that the event is seeing a turnaround. And because of the improvement in the fundamentals, we feel that the massive value creation or a relating is going to happen. Now, this is all about the Phoenix uh, life cycle. The portfolio or the stocks which are a part of the Phoenix like, uh, you know, are going to follow this exactly the life cycle as it has been shown. And we are looking at at, at, at uh, those stocks where we feel that uh, the cycles of disruption has been witnessed and the value creation or a re-rating becomes a natural phenomenon. Now, if I see what could the three stages for any company to you know, go through this entire turnaround, obviously uh, either turnaround has already is about to occur, you know, that you have been able to find a company where you can see that, yes, like a Maharashtra seamless, which is a part of our portfolio. We were a little ahead of curve in terms of, uh, in terms of having the stock in the portfolio. And later on, we realized that even a promoter started buying, uh, you know, at a, at a cost which were little, a bit which of which was way above us. So we were like be in the stock, little ahead of just when the turnaround events were about to occur. You know, like an event had already occurred, and now we are in a position to see a lot of positive implications on the businesses. Uh, it could be the like coal India is a classic case to talk about it, where we know the very fact that uh, a special situation, which is the, the because of the transparencies that has come in in the e-auction through the e-auction mode and all. Uh, yes, the turnaround event has occurred, and now the realizations are getting captured in the form of PAT growth and eventually resulting into ROEs, expansions and all. Or it could be the you know after the turnaround event has happened, some strong visibilities on the earnings that you are able to witness, and hence you feel that you know this could be a target like investment zone, like a Bharti could be a classic case. We have seen you know all the clouds around the around the company or rather around the sector to per se, and then this being the leader in the sector around the company, which was through an AGR issue. It could be the hostile approach of a geo on the price wars. All are getting settled now. They're talking about deleveraging the balance sheets. They're talking about a Nasdaq listing. Uh, they're talking about ARPU getting beyond 200 to and heading back to 300 kind of a number. So you know, so all of these are the classic cases where we feel that the visibilities are getting better as we go forward, and all of them together results into a massive uh, value creation, which is what the objective of of the portfolio 
uh, which is a part of this uh, Phoenix fund. Now, as I was mentioning, you know, that turnaround cycles could be because of whatever reason. It could be internal factors, it could be external factors. Internal factors can be, you know, there is a change in management, there is a change in ownership, uh, being a business gets restructured because the, the management feels that a certain businesses aren't a part of their core and hence they can look at hiving them off. It could be the new product introduction or a new market they, where they are venturing into and or, or it could be that, you know, you are looking at a far more optimal allocations of the capital. Uh, these are all internal factors which can lead to a turnaround event. Uh, but there could be multiple external factors like an industry dynamics are completely changing. As I was mentioning about a telecom sector, the dynamics of the industries are changing with a lot of clarity now coming in. Or it could be because of, uh, because of the government's own approach of making the changes on the regulatory nature. Or it could be a lot of mergers, acquisitions, joint ventures. So these are the external factors where where you know where where which also influences the company becoming a target turnaround candidate so these are internal and an external two of them together leads to a turnaround event and that's where we are looking at it now what does that do all these turnaround events results into as as quite naturally i'm sure that doesn't need too much of an explanation that an accelerated earnings growth could lead to any improved margins longevity on earnings visibility and healthier balance sheets. So, you know, so that's basically what we mean is that, uh, you know, whichever our way I look at it, the balance sheets are getting stronger, the financials visibilities are becoming far and more uh, better. And, 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 and that's the a typical turnaround cycle, the way one we looks at it. Now, this is, I know on this uh, slide, if you could see, this does, not, this speaks nothing, but it's basically the framework of our uh, entire investment thesis. So if I, I just spend a minute on this for you all to understand how do we really uh, work. If I go back and look at the 35, 40 odd years, whether if, even if I look at a profitability at a company's level or an ROE at a indices, we have seen the 15 be the, being the magical number where most of these uh, you know, uh, things are getting converged. And hence, we looked at 15 as a number. On an x-axis, we looked at ROEs, return on equity, and a y-axis in PAC. And we divided this entire matrix into four quadrants. The extreme right quadrant with the secular is nothing but talking about looking at those companies which have demonstrated in last 15 odd years, both ROE and PAC in excess of 15%. And as a house, seculars are our core portfolio. We always remain overweight on secular. And these are like all your consumption oriented businesses like a banks, insurance, retail, and as a house, we always remain overweight on secular. But what we do, we always remain underweight on value traps. Now, value traps are generally the businesses which have seen a tepid PAT or a tepid ROEs. But, and they are largely the PSUs or the regulated businesses where even if you have some handsome profits getting made, government will intervene, take the money out, but they will never let the money stay in the balance sheet. And we do not normally like these kind of businesses. We feel that they have their small patches but eventually they struggle. And hence, we as a house remain always underweight on value traps. Now, other two parts, cyclicals and a defensive. Cyclicals now normally are the businesses which are largely capital intensive businesses. These are the businesses which are which, which shows a better profitability, but a very, very uh, you know, timid uh, ROEs and all. And, and just opposite to our defensive, which doesn't need too much of capital location, like a, you know, a IT services, media, and the worlds of those. We tactically keep shifting between cyclicals and defenses. So our core is very clear. Secular is our core. Value traps are the restricted allocation. We don't look at it. And cyclical and defensive, we keep doing a tactical changes. That's the framework that we normally follow. But Phoenix is an exception to this framework. Phoenix is a portfolio where other than our natural or normal phenomenon of being overweight on secular and underweight on value trap, we actually have taken just the opposite call. We are overweight on value traps and underweight on secular. Now, when I say overweight on value traps, not necessarily all the companies need to be the part of PSUs or utilities because I'm talking about ROEs getting compressed and a pad getting compressed, automatically you will fall in the value trap. So we have a scient as one of the stocks in the company or we have a Alembic Pharma, but, but, these, are, but these are not the businesses where I can say that they are either PSU or telecom or utilities, but by virtue of, of the, the, the cycle that they have been through in the last two odd years, 
they had they had been you know they have seen a, a massive compression in a pad resulting into an ROE also getting compressed and hence they become a natural stocks for us to look at it. Now, if you go back, what did I say? I think when you do not know which way the markets are going to go, are the markets expensive, are the markets cheap? I think the best way to look at the portfolio where you see the draw, drawdown risks being minimal. Now, if I'm looking at a value traps being a dominant part of the portfolio, then one thing I'm also mentioning very clearly that these are the stocks which haven't performed very well for the reasons well established till now that you would have heard me and would have understood why these companies haven't done very well because they had gone through a massive challenging time in their recent past. Though the fact remains they have an excellent past, but the recent past had been pretty challenging for them. And we feel as we go ahead, the times ahead for them are very, very exciting. Now, these are nothing but a stock selection criteria. Any stock which become a part of the portfolio has to undergo these seven criteria. Uh, yes, as I mentioned, everything has to move up the curve. So idea is whatever we take in the portfolio should is eventually converge becoming a secular. And that's the reason we said upgrade in a quadrant on SCDB is a very, very important phenomenon. Lower profitability versus historical trends doesn't need an explanation as I was mentioning. Third point is very important, proven track record. But if the companies need to show up track record of at least six to seven years out of the last 10 to 15 years of ROE demonstration in excess of 15%. So I'm not going to look at a garbage in, garbage out kind of a thing, even if they are a perfect candidate of a turnaround. But we are going to look at the companies who had demonstrated an ROE on excess of 15% in the past, but for some reasons aren't been able to do in the recent past. Uh, they need to trade at a discount to the historical valuations. The changes in management or ownership could be the reason. Uh, the point number six, again, is something which is part of our DNA. Uh, governs, uh, you know, the, the forensics and the strong governance is something that uh, at a balance sheet level or a, at a promoter level is something which is non-negotiable for us. And obviously stocks have, have to show the price correction uh, from what the historical trends had been. So if the stocks are meeting these seven criteria, they become a natural candidate to be a part of the Phoenix portfolio. Now, there are multiple cases. I don't want to spend time on them, uh, but straight away I come to the portfolio and, and probably spend a minute over here. So what you can see, uh, let's look at the right side top quadrant and probably segment breakup. And you can already see the value traps are close to 31%. Now, this is exactly what I meant. So we are pretty close to the benchmark. Normally you will see a V being not more than six, 7% of the benchmark for a value trap, but here we are pretty much equivated. But look at the seculars. Uh, against the benchmark of 22, we are just 88%. And that's exactly the point that I was making that knowingly we have built a portfolio where we would want to look at turnaround stories. For turnaround stories, you have to look at something in value traps or something in cyclicals, which again is showing our dominant uh, you know, allocations with the, with the benchmark. But let's be, let's be uh, you know, let me use a disclaimer that all of these segment breakups that you could see at a portfolio level is not an outcome of managing the numbers, but it's basically an outcome of picking the stocks. So we had only, we are in the business of picking the stocks and eventually they all result into their allocations. But by virtue of the thesis of the portfolio, the way the portfolio needs to get constructed, automatically the outcome is desirable the way it ideally should have been. On a market cap basis also, if you would have seen, it's a pretty much 50-50 large and a non-large. And if I'm talking about a, uh, you know, a turnaround stories and all of that, obviously I will have to move beyond the domain of a large cap and which is the reason uh, it's showing like this. And that's where another point that I would want to make in. You know, today, if you go to a client and tell a client like, look, I have a great fund. And why don't you take it in your client, in your portfolio? The very first question the client would ask is why? Because I already have a five portfolio. Why should I take the sixth one? The answer to this why is the uniqueness. The Phoenix portfolio, if you would go and have a look at the entire portfolio and do a, a common checks, the commonality factor is not more than 20%. Now, because of this commonality factor not being 20%, this shows a lot of uniqueness and hence the client who, who gets offered this portfolio also accept it very graciously because he knows that he's also onboarding some new ideas which aren't a part of his portfolio if you go and look back. And that's where another uniqueness which comes for this uh, Phoenix fund, which is 
the common factor, if I look at this portfolio, vis-a-vis -vis most of the portfolio in the market, that commonality is not more than 20, 25%. Now, this is a very, very strong slide, which will help you understand why a fund like this uh, you know, makes a lot of sense. Let's look at the last, uh, you know, called, uh, last uh, row, which talks about EPS growth. I'm talking about 21% EPS, vis-a-vis a 15%, -vis a, a strong arbitrage of six odd percent. The command that turnaround fund is having over the indices is yet priced at two, where the indices are at 2.6. So basically a better growth, a better growth, not yet priced in. Can this be a good reason for one to look at it? If I am telling you that, look, I can give, I can grow the portfolio 21%, but you haven't yet priced me in. I think that becomes a strong reason for one to say that, look, this is a great portfolio for one to look at it. And hence, uh, we feel another very strong reason for one to look at uh, the Phoenix fund. Our top 10 holdings, are what it is, maybe a few of you would say that, you know, a couple of names that I can see on the tops are a very, very common name. But to me, names does matter. Yeah, fair. But what matter more is at what point of time have you onboarded those names? I think to me, I think that's, that's equally uh, a critical uh, a, a thing for one to consider. For example, when we took ICICA or an access, we haven't taken them post uh, Mr. Bakshi or uh, Mr. Amitabh moving in. It all, and which ideally become a candidate, the stocks become a candidate because as I mentioned, management change is also one of the criteria. But actually we onboarded both the banks much ahead of time because we started loving or liking the orient the change of orientation of a bank from a wholesale oriented to the retail oriented. And that's the trigger which started making us excited and we started onboarding. And the other stocks that you can see, Maharashtra similar result has recently come. A fantastic result. They have onboarded the new products and they have started getting into the offshore market. They still work at a 70% capacity, strong operating leverage as a case for one to talk about it. Uh, you know, I think Blue Dart, as you can see, is something that we have already started pruning. Much of the position we have already pruned, some is still left in the, in the, in the portfolio. It has delivered exceedingly well uh, for us. You know, the one thing that we also do when we look at the portfolios, we basically follow the same uh, trend line as I was mentioning to you uh, at the beginning. Uh, yeah, this one. So basically, idea is to look at the stocks which are closer to one standard deviation minus negative. And as they start moving from minus one standard deviation to the average, is the time when you start accumulating and after average to the plus one standard deviation is the time when you would start offloading the stock. So this is something which Anup and the team, uh, besides uh, you know, uh, the framework, which obviously helps them uh, decide on what stocks to onboard and what not to, it's also a nice style of, uh, of a price to book valuation metrics that they also consider in terms of uh, looking at the exit strategies for the at a stock level. Uh, these are top 10 holding that we have in the portfolio. Uh, the fund has done exceedingly well, uh, especially last six odd months. If you can see, you know, it has it has it has really performed uh, well. Uh, as I said, uh, these kind of strategies are not the strategies one can think of in a 10,000, 20,000 crore strategies. Right. These strategies have the finite sizes, and uh, and with the finite sizes, you know, it makes sense. Uh, you know, if then the funds are smaller, so the size of the fund is close to thousand odd crores, not even thousand six hundred crores. So that also makes the fund a very optimal sized fund for one to consider. That's right. from my side, Aditya.